had and will continue to have with the Irish Government. Thank you very much. I'm going to apologise to Rhoda Grant once more and to Peter Chapman. Apologies, there's not enough time. I imagine both subjects will be coming back to the Chamber, but we're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a, st uh, sorry, a statement by John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary, on an update on P1 standardised assessments. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary to press their request to speak buttons as soon as they possibly can. Okay. And I call on John Swinney. <coughs> President Officer, on the 19th of September last year, Parliament debated the Scottish National Standardised Assessments and voted in favour of a motion that called for two distinct actions, a halt to P1 assessments and for us to consider the evidence about how best to progress the assessment of pupils in P1. I understand the views expressed in this Parliament and I'm alive to the concerns expressed by MSPs and others about the P1 assessments. In the light of the parliamentary motion, I judged the appropriate response was to reconsider the evidence and that if we were to stop P1 assessments, that decision should be based on independent expert educational advice. I therefore commissioned an independent review of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments in Primary 1. The purpose of the review was to take a clear, reasoned look at the evidence and provide an informed way forward. The review would have had sufficient scope to endorse the criticisms voiced on the 19th of September and recommend an end to the SNSAs in P1, should that be what the evidence directed. I set out this approach clearly to Parliament on the 25th of October. Taking advice from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Education, I commissioned David Reedy to conduct that review. Mr Reedy possessed the necessary educational experience and expertise to secure professional credibility for this role. Mr Reedy was, for example, co-director of the Cambridge Primary Review Trust from 2013 to 2017 and has served as both General Secretary and President of the United Kingdom Literacy Association. As someone who had not been involved in the debate on SNSAs until that point, he was also perfectly positioned to apply the required objective rigour to this review. Between January and March this year, David Reedy gathered information, conducting stakeholder interviews, inviting written feedback, and examining the submissions to and findings from the P1 Practitioner Forum and the Education and Skills Committee inquiry into the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. Crucially, he visited schools to observe the SNSA being delivered to primary one children in real time. The review could not have been fully or meaningfully informed had it not been possible for Mr Reedy to witness children undertaking the assessments firsthand and to talk to the teachers involved. The Scottish Government gave clear advice to schools in September. They should continue to implement the assessments as they had been doing, pending the findings of the independent review commissioned to re-examine the evidence at Parliament's behest. Continuing to deliver the assessments was encouraged both for reasons of consistency, guarding against the creation of an information vacuum, and to ensure that the independent review was considering evidence based on the second year of assessment delivery. This was also undertaken with the recognition that feedback had already been gathered and acted upon to further improve the system, particularly in relation to P1 following the first year. There would have been little value in examining a position from which SNSAs had already moved on. 142 primary one teachers, 131 senior school staff and more than 50 wider stakeholders were involved during this phase. And I thank everyone who took the time to submit comments or agreed to meet with or demonstrate the assessments to David Reedy. Their contributions and the sharing of their views was of the utmost importance in helping Mr Reedy form his conclusions. Those conclusions have been published today alongside a set of recommendations, both for the Scottish Government and for local authorities. Having been asked explicitly to consider whether the primary one assessments should be stopped, Mr Reedy's answer in his independent review is that they should not. Rather, David Reedy concludes it would be beneficial for them to continue, albeit with important modifications and the establishment of additional guidance and support for practitioners to ensure they deliver their intended value as low stakes diagnostic assessments. Mr Reedy acknowledges that the assessments can provide an additional source of objective, nationally consistent information about where a child is performing strongly and where he or she might require further support. I do not suggest this review has delivered 
an unqualified green light to the Scottish Government in terms of P1 assessments. Clearly, the review makes important recommendations about improvement and I'm determined to take the valuable learning contained within Mr Reedy's review and act upon it to introduce the recommended modifications and safeguards in order to firstly further improve the assessment experience for P1s, secondly strengthen understanding of the purpose of the assessments and thirdly to ensure that practitioners see the benefit of the information the assessments provide. Fundamentally however the key review finding which Mr Reedy articulates in his report and the key message that should be taken away from his report is this. Primary one Scottish National Standardised Assessment has potential to play a significant role in informing and enhancing teachers' professional judgments and should be continued. I was reassured to read that Mr Reedy identified, and I quote, scant evidence of children becoming upset when taking the P1 SNSA but I acknowledge the significance of his observation that the attitudes of those delivering assessments can influence children's confidence. We must ensure practitioners are appropriately supported and equipped to deliver assessments in such a way that they are perceived positively by the children undertaking them. Mr Reedy also considered the compatibility of the assessments with a play-based approach to learning. The review makes a clear and helpful distinction between a pedagogical approach to play-based learning in the early years, which the Scottish Government fully endorses, and which is at the heart of the Curriculum for Excellence at early level, and what David Reedy describes as a moment of assessment. The review confirmed that it was eminently possible, and indeed valuable, to assess children in the early years through diagnostic means, such as the SNSA, while remaining true to the principles of play-based learning. The report states, and again I quote, there are strong examples of schools where head teachers and teachers operate a play-based approach and find no incompatibility between that and the primary one SNSA. It is evident that the need for a shared understanding of the aims, purpose and value of the SNSA drives many of the review recommendations. I am happy to commit today to redoubling our efforts in terms of communications and engagement with practitioners and all stakeholders to clarifying our messages, strengthening our guidance and ensuring wider uh, access to SNSA training. Mr Reedy also identified important reservations regarding the length of the literacy assessment and its alignment to the benchmarks. Again, I accept the recommendation to review that assessment and explore with ASAR, the company who developed the assessments, the potential for reducing the number of questions presented to primary one children. Before concluding, presiding officer, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the wider scrutiny of the SNSAs, which is run in parallel with the review. As members will be aware, the Education and Skills Committee has now reported on their inquiry into the SNSAs. The P1 Practitioner Forum I convened last December has produced a number of recommendations for enhancing the P1 assessment experience. In addition, our own annual user review, intended to feed into our cycle of continuous improvement for the assessments, has produced interim findings ahead of the end of the school session. I thank the committee and the P1 Forum, chaired by Professor Sue Ellis, for their thoughtful and detailed consideration of the issues. All of their reports contain valuable suggestions for ways in which to improve aspects of the communications around and implementation of the SNSAs. Importantly, none has made any recommendation to scrap the assessments. That, I believe, reflects the evidence that Parliament required us to, be cons to, to consider and provides the basis and the rationale for the SNSAs to continue to be applied as the independent review recommends. Where further vindication needed, I would direct members' attention to the learner feedback we have gathered during this academic year from a question within the SNAC system itself. 91% of primary one children who have undertaken the assessments say that they enjoyed the experience. That statistics represents the views of the children themselves. I accept there is work to be done, but believe that with the improvements proposed, we can move forward in the correct direction. Today I published the Scottish Government's individual responses to Mr Reedy's independent review, the Education and Skills Committee's inquiry report and the P1 Practitioner Forum 
along with the progress report on the SNSA user review for 2018-19. In addition, given the clear overlap in focus and read across between a number of areas raised in the different reports, I intend to publish a summary that draws together all of the actions the Scottish Government will undertake over the coming months. I have published a draft of that action plan today. The draft identifies eight, over, eight overarching themes for actions to be taken forward in response to all report recommendations. We will take that draft to the Scottish Education Council for review and feedback, working with practitioners to agree the details of our approach to implementing recommendations before producing a final action plan at the start of the new school year. Presiding Officer, as Parliament requested, I have reconsidered the evidence. As we approach the end of the second year of delivery, we now have a far clearer picture of the views of both P1 children and their teachers towards these assessments. An impartial review has confirmed the value of the SNSAs. A constructive action plan for enhancing the assessments, consolidating their value and delivering on their potential has been laid out. I hope that members will join me in accepting Mr Reedy's findings and in focusing, as we must, on delivering an education system in Scotland which raises attainment for all, closes the attainment gap, enables all children and young people to fulfil their potential. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'll just remind members that we're very pushed for time this afternoon. So after the opening questioners uh, for each of the parties have had their opening statements, I'd like all questions to be succinct and to the point and answers likewise. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and also for the copy of the independent review. The Cabinet Secretary states that on the 19th of September last year, this Parliament voted to halt the P1 tests and to review the evidence. And let me remind him why the Parliament and the opposition parties were doing that. That was because we were listening to the concerns, the many concerns that were expressed by primary teachers, parents groups, teaching unions, who told us that there was not sufficient evidence to prove that the tests were in the best educational interests of primary one pupils. These concerns were then echoed at the Education Committee on the 30th of January by other organisations such as Upstart Scotland and Children in Scotland. So my three questions to the Cabinet Secretary relate to the evidence. What specific educational evidence has the Cabinet Secretary seen which convinces him that he is right and others wrong when it comes to promoting this type of formal testing of five-year-olds as being both necessary and appropriate, particularly in light of the fact that the Reedy Review has not undertaken any in-depth analysis of the evidence from other countries which do not start formal testing as early as P1. Secondly, can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Parliament why, in light of the Parliament voting against these P1 tests, he chose in mid-April this year to announce modifications to the tests before waiting for the full review to be completed. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, he says in his statement on page two, and I quote, there would have been little value in examining a position from which the SNSAs had already moved on. Cabinet Secretary, I do not understand why you make this point when in mid-April your announcement was doing the exact opposite. Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, can I say to Liz Smith that David Reedy's review has done exactly what the Parliament asked us to do, uh, which was to look at the evidence in relation to the educational evidence on this question. And that's the, the basis of my judgment. I, I'm interested only in whether there is educational value here. And the substance, the substantive, there's a lot of information covered in David Reedy's report, but one of the key points which I think is there is the important assistance the assessments provide in moderation across schools in Scotland to uh, enable teachers to be confident about the judgment they are, uh, that they are exercising about the progress of young people, given the fact that the Scottish National Standardised Assessments for the first time under Curriculum for Excellence gives them an assessment which is related to Curriculum for Excellence and assists in providing them with confidence that young people are reaching the appropriate level that is envisaged in the early level of the curriculum. So that's just one example. And secondly, um, and, and also I would add to that, 
that David Reedy has spoken to many, many organizations and many, many practitioners and has seen practice in place, many of the organizations that Elizabeth raised in her question to me in coming to this evidence report. The second point was about the P1 Practitioner Forum, and I believe it was important that I should uh, respond as swiftly as possible to the views of practitioners uh, in a body that I had established to hear practitioners' views, and if practitioners believed there were ways in which the assessments could be enhanced, we should take them at the earliest possible opportunity. And the third point that I would say, th that I would respond to in Liz Smith's question, is the is the important point that I accepted in a September of last year that if there were specific educational issues that had to be addressed about the P1 standardised assessments, we should do that at the earliest possible opportunity. That is precisely why I've taken the actions that I've taken. Ian Gray to be followed by Ross <coughs> Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement. The Cabinet Secretary says that this review does exactly what Parliament told him to do, but of course it doesn't. Parliament told him to stop P1 testing. And it may be that the Reedy Review doesn't say that, but it does say that these tests need a clear rationale. They obviously don't have one. It says that these tests must not and cannot be aggregated to draw general con conclusions or to compare schools or local authorities Yet the Scottish Government have repeatedly claimed that they can. The review says that the administration of the tests must be flexible, but we know that 80% of P1 tests were administered at the same time of year. The Reedy Review says the P1 tests must be changed in order to align with curriculum for excellence. They clearly do not. So the review may say that the tests have potential, but its evidence says that Parliament's concerns back in September were well founded. So what gives the Deputy First Minister the right to traduce those concerns, to ignore that decision and to defy Parliament's will? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I've accepted that uh, there has to be a clear rationale about these assessments and uh, David Reedy uh, reinforces the argument which I've advanced to the committee that these are um, assessments with, with a diagnostic purpose. That is their purpose, to assist, assist, pupils, uh, assist teachers and pupils in identifying the progress that requires to be made. And I, I've accepted that there needs to be a clear rationale and for that to be embedded within these assessments. Secondly, um, Ian Gray says that the assessments are not related to curriculum for excellence. I have to disagree with him on that point. And Mr Reedy doesn't substantiate that point in his report. What David Reedy has said is that the literacy uh, assessment um, may be, may, may, would benefit from being shortened, and that is exactly what we will explore with the company involved. Uh, and, and the third point that I would say to Mr Gray is this. Throughout all of this, I've been interested in the educational arguments for standardised assessments. That's what I've been interested in. And Parliament in September, and, I, and this was the first paragraph of my statement, uh, voted for a halt to P1 assessments, but then asked us to consider the evidence about how best to progress the assessment of pupils in P1. Now, I uh, took a decision which I reported to Parliament in October to encourage the assessments to take their course to give us a second year of evidence. And then we've looked further at the evidence which David, and I've commissioned David Reedy to undertake that, re that, that review, to give us that evidence, and I now present that evidence to Parliament. And what the evidence says is that there is a benefit, an educational benefit for these assessments. They should have their purpose clarified, but they should be maintained, and that's the government's intention. Ross Greer to be followed by Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to the Deputy First Minister for the statement and accompanying papers. Given the government's primary objective for these tests is to inform teacher judgment, Parliament has still not been presented with compelling evidence that the P1 tests usefully inform that judgment. We have heard concerns from teachers, parents, education and child development experts about the negative effects of the tests and the confusion surrounding their introduction, though. 
In giving evidence to the Education Committee, the Deputy First Minister first claimed that the tests are formative, not summative. Later that same morning, he stated that the tests are somehow both formative and summative. So given that he's been unable to clearly explain the purpose of standardised tests himself, how does the Deputy First Minister expect teachers and parents who opposed P1 testing from the start to have any confidence in a policy that this government seems to refuse to drop? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the first point I'd make is that I, I'm accepting today that there is a need to strengthen the rationale for the assessments. That was a point that came out of the Education Committee's in inquiry, and I'm happy to accept that point. The second issue that Mr Greer raises is about um, the, the nature of how these assessments are described. Um, and and he, he, he accurately reflects the exchange that he and I had at committee. But I do want to put it into a little bit of context. Uh, I was asked um, whether the tests were formative or, or summative, and I said they were formative for all the reasons I've just explained to Ian Gray. But I also accepted the point, and it's just an acceptance of reality, that if you add up all the numbers, they inevitably become summative. But that's not their purpose. It's simply an honest answer to a question that I was asked in the committee. So let me be absolutely crystal clear with Parliament. These are formative assessments to inform teacher judgment, and I believe they add a valuable component, particularly on the question of moderation that I replied to Liz Smith about, to support teachers in their professional judgment. Tavis Scott, to be followed by Jenny Gilbreth. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, statement? Can you explain to Parliament why he hired an academic from the English educational regime that nationalists condemn from a country where high stakes testing is the norm to produce the arguments he wants? Can you illustrate how many more reports par Parliament is planning to see when teachers, unions, parent groups, and this Parliament all said halt the testing of four and five year old boys and girls? Can you tell teachers in primary one? what their workload will now be, given all the more guidance he's now produced and the new action plan he's announced today? What's the increase going to be in their workload and in the bureaucracy they face uh, every day? And if parliamentary democracy is so important, why is this government so determined to press on with these tests when Parliament said don't do it? Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, I, I simply offer David Reedy's uh, independent uh, credibility as a leading expert on literacy um, and, and questions of literacy uh, as justification for recruiting a man of significant independent educational expertise who's not got an axe to grind on Scottish education. So I simply invited an individual who's got an academic track record to provide us with some independent evidence. And, 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 let, me, and let me place on record my thanks to David Reedy for being prepared to do so. Secondly, um, in relation to the points that Tavish Scott raises about um, primary one teachers' workload, um, what I'm trying to do is to make sure that uh, teachers have uh, the ability to rely upon a substantive assessment that will assist them in the crucial role of moderating uh, the educational performance of young people. And the steps that we're taking are to make that as convenient and as straightforward and as accessible as possible for teachers in primary one. And thirdly, uh, Tavis Scott supported a motion which called on us, yes, to halt the assessments, but also to consider the evidence. And I've considered the evidence, and the evidence says that our assessments are perfectly valid to be taken forward as a rational con contributor to assessing the progress of young people. And that's why I believe it's important to implement the, uh, the, the, the view taken by Parliament in the fashion that I've set out this afternoon. Thank you. All the parties have outlined their positions. So just questions from now on, please. Jenny Gilruth, be followed by Alison Harris. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given that the standardised assessments replace what was already used in 28 out of Scotland's 32 local authority areas, can the Cabinet Secretary explain how the Scottish Government will ensure they are not used in addition to those which existed previously, many of which were not benchmarked against curriculum for excellence? Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, uh, what, what, this has been a project in which we've had um, excellent cooperation with our local authority partners. Our local authority partners have been um, uh, involved in all of the preparation of the standardised assessments. Uh, in a, number, a limited number of local authority areas, uh, local authorities are continuing with the former assessments they undertook to give them a consistency check uh, for future years. I think on a temporary basis that's an entirely reasonable proposition. But the Scottish National Standardised Assessments 
uh, are relevant to curriculum for excellence and provide an opportunity for local authorities not to use other assessments which have not been related to curriculum for excellence and obviously we'll work with our local authority partners through the actions I've set out in the Scottish Education Council where local government are full partners with us in taking forward these issues. Alison Harris to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. Despite this independent review, a survey from February this year revealed that 41% of teachers disagreed that the tests were beginning to inform teaching and another 17% were unsure. That's nearly 60% of the teaching profession disagreeing or unsure. In light of this, are the standardised tests really capable of delivering their intended purpose of informing teaching? Cameron um, I, I'm not sure if Alison Harris was one of the members of Parliament who, was in, who took up the opportunity to see a demonstration of the assessments. But what she would have seen in that was the diagnostic um, uh, information which is generated on every child. And the feedback that I get from individual teachers is that that diagnostic information is um, quick and simple to consider and gives teachers an opportunity to judge whether or not the prevailing judgment in their view is accurate or whether there are issues which they believe require further investigation. So I think that's, that's the, 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 the opportunity that the diagnostic assessment provides for teachers. And obviously it gives that reassurance, which I raised in my answer to Liz Smith, that the, the teachers are seeing a position that is relevant to what is expected in the early years of the curriculum, and that's of benefit to the judgment, the professional judgment of teachers. Tom Arthur to be followed by Mary Fee. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how standardised assessments at Primary 1 can support teachers in closing the attainment gap in schools in my constituency of Renfrewshire South? Obviously because the, 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 of the, the diagnostic information readily identifies um, areas where uh, young people uh, may well have challenges in their own educational performance and um, that will help teachers to um, undertake what is increasingly happening within Scottish education which is a relentless focus on closing that gap of identifying the obstacles that exist in young people's education and supporting them to overcome those obstacles and that will apply in Mr Arthur's constituency in Renfrewshire South and of course because these are available across the country related to curriculum for excellence it will apply in all other, other areas as well. Mary Fee to be followed by, Fulton, sorry Tom Arthur to be followed by Mary Fee. Sorry, you know, Mary Fee to be followed by Fulton McGregor. <laughs> Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. David Reedy concludes it would be beneficial for these tests to continue, albeit with important modifications and the establishment of additional guidance and support for practitioners. Can the Cabinet Secretary give the Chamber some detail of the important modifications that are required and the timescale for implementation? Secretary. Some of the, I, th I think perhaps the most important modification is in relation to the length of the literacy assessment and that's something which we have to discuss with the, uh, the company involved in the uh, design and the delivery of the assessment. Uh, we'll do that as a matter of urgency and of course I'll be very happy to keep Parliament informed uh, on that specific point. Um, the other important modifications will largely relate to the description and outline of the purpose of the assessments and I think Mr Reedy gives us a really strong framework within which we can operate to ensure that at no stage could these assessments be viewed as high stakes and that they are in fact low stakes diagnostic assessments and I'm determined to make sure that's the characteristic that these assessments have. And Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how the Scottish Government can ensure that all local authorities, including North Lanarkshire, integrate the standardised assessments with a play-based learning approach for all primary ones? Cabinet Secretary. I think I'm really anxious to separate out two issues in this question, and, one, and I think these issues have become somewhat conjoined. One issue is about the importance of a play-based curriculum for young people, and that is at the heart of the early level of curriculum for excellence. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, in the statement that I've set out today that compromises that play-based curriculum. David Reedy helpfully makes the distinction between, what he, what, between a play-based curriculum and what he calls a moment of assessment. At some stage, assessment will be undertaken for children who are involved in a play-based curriculum. Um, David really correctly characterises how that can be undertaken with the Scottish National Standardised Assessment. But I do want to make it absolutely crystal clear today that the government firmly believes that a play-based curriculum in the early level 
is an, an absolutely vital foundation of how young people acquire their learning at that stage in their educational development. Thank you very much. And apologies to Joanne Lamont, Oliver Mundell, Rona Mackay and John Mason. As I'm afraid, we're just too pushed for time this afternoon. We've got two bills to get through. And that concludes this statement. We're just going to pause as we turn to the next item of business.